One of the biggest hurdles to learning to play theoretically sound poker is developing the ability to think in ranges. To illustrate, let's assume you're in a cash game in the cutoff, holding ace-queen in a single raised pot on a queen-queen-5 rainbow board. What do you do? The beginner would likely just auto-bet based on the strength of their hand. However, from a theory perspective, if you gave any answer to this question, you would be wrong. This is because the optimal strategy is heavily dependent on, among other things, how the ranges match up. If villain was in the big blind, then you would bet 100% of the time. But if villain was on the button, you would check nearly 100% of the time. The reason for this discrepancy, despite the fact that the cutoff's hand and range is exactly the same in both scenarios, is because from a theory perspective, we always want to take the actions that maximize EV, which is determined by the probability of outcomes given the likely hands for both players, or in other words, the player's ranges. However, for many, thinking in ranges can be difficult. You have a limited time to act, and in most situations the possible combos can number in the hundreds. One common way to deal with this issue is to truncate your analysis by focusing on certain regions of the ranges that you think are the most prevalent, since these are the hands that will impact the EV equation most significantly. But there are a couple of potential pitfalls with this type of targeted analysis. For one, it's very easy to fall down a rabbit hole and get fixated on a handful of combos that may not be representative of the entire range. This is especially true on the river, where range construction requires an understanding of what the preflop ranges look like, and how those ranges were subsequently altered on each street by player actions and the board cards. Keeping the universe of likely combos in your mind street over street can be overwhelming. Secondly, even if you're able to accurately construct most of the player's ranges, it can be difficult to then take the next step and estimate how to maximize EV with so many different combos floating in your head. So today we're going to be discussing a concept that addresses both of these concerns, range morphologies. Now range morphologies aren't new, they've been discussed at length going years back. However, typically range morphologies have been analyzed in the context of very simplified toy games which have limited applicability to the full game of poker. So we at GTO Check have developed more realistic paradigms of range morphologies for practical use and designed a new interface to help users build their understanding of this important concept. This new interface is part of the launch of GTO Check 3.0, where we will also be introducing a new quick solving algorithm which allows users to calculate hundreds of hands in the cloud at a fraction of the previous cost. Check out the description if you want to learn more. To illustrate the power of range morphologies, we're going to analyze a few hands that I played during the course of testing. So let's start by taking a look at one of the most common scenarios in poker, where the button raised and I called in the big blind with queen nine of diamonds. The flop came king king three, I checked, and the button bet third pot. So not too surprisingly, both of these plays are standard. The big blind checks range, and the button essentially bets range. But let's stop to consider why this is the case. When we take a look at the ranges and hand classes for both players juxtaposed, they aren't too dissimilar. Both players have some trips, some underpairs, and a whole lot of trash. So why are the strategies so drastically different between the two players? Well, although position has some impact here, the primary driver of these strategies is the range matchup between the players. Although the ranges on this board aren't completely dissimilar, there are some key differences that have a significant impact. To begin with, the big blind's range is what we refer to as bottom heavy. That is, proportionally, most of the range consists of trash and it is at a significant nut disadvantage. A bottom heavy range is commonly created in one of two ways. One, when a player does not have the betting initiative, limited bets have been placed, meaning that his range is wide, and the board either favors villain or is neutral. So, for example, in most single raised or limp pots, on many boards, the big blind will have a bottom heavy range. The second circumstance where a bottom heavy range is sometimes created is where a board dynamically and disproportionately creates many nuttish hands for only one player. For example, when a runout gives villain many flushes or straights, which renders hero's range mostly trash. Offensively, a bottom heavy range typically plays very passively, and when it does bet, it is usually on the smaller size. Defensively, a bottom heavy range is often attacked with small sizings, as we see is the case here. On the flip side, the button's range is what we refer to as more balanced relative to the opponent's range, with some weak, some medium, and some strong hands. Although the button's range is also wide, as the preflop aggressor, it has a not insignificant advantage at the top of the range, 
with overpairs and a greater percentage of trips. And this is a key difference. A bottom heavy range is mostly capped, whereas a balanced range will either have the nut advantage or at least have a significant proportion of nuttage hands himself. Additionally, the button also has a greater percentage of stronger underpairs and less trash, hence making it more balanced, relatively speaking. A balanced range will most often be created when a player has the betting initiative and the board either is favorable or neutral to that player. A player without the initiative can also achieve a balanced range, typically when the board becomes very favorable to him. Since a balanced range is comprised of a full spectrum of different equity profiles, defensively it can face a variety of bet sizings and raises, targeting various regions of the range, and offensively it may attack the opponent with a variety of sizings as well, with the optimal sizing often dictated by villain's range shape. In cases like this, where we have a balanced range versus a very bottom heavy range, what we will often see is a small sizing used with very high frequency. And we can understand why this is when we analyze each region of the balanced range from the EV perspective. First, let's start with the button's weakest hands, such as Jack-8 off, Queen-4 suited, and 9-6 suited. Hypothetically, if we were to play a passive checking strategy with these types of hands, the most likely outcome is either we end up getting bluffed and forced to fold, or we lose at showdown. So the EV of checking will be relatively low. However, since the big blind has a very bottom heavy range on this extremely dry board, it means that the likelihood of him folding to even a very small bet is relatively high. There's no straight draws, no flush draws, he has very few pairs, and he can only draw to one overcard, an ace. Accordingly, the Bun's EV for betting with its trash will be decent, especially since from an efficiency standpoint, a very small bet should result in a significant number of folds. Being out of position and at a significant nut disadvantage, the big blind simply will have a hard time defending with much of its range. This concept of overfolding may seem foreign to those of you who have been indoctrinated in the church of MDF, but the truth is that in most scenarios, full percentage isn't dictated solely by the bet size. Range matchups also have a significant impact. So since the EV for checking is low and the EV for betting is decent, this means that basically all of the button's trash will have an incentive to bet small in this spot to take the pot down now. Remember, one half of the EV equation is probability, and the probability of getting folds versus this bottom heavy range is high. Now let's think about the button's middling hands, such as under pairs and 3x. These hands are ahead of most of the big blind's range, but they are very vulnerable to bad turns and rivers. At the same time, they don't really want to grow a large pot because if the big blind continues versus a large bet, the button's middling hands will end up being behind most of the big blind's calling range. So when this class of hands can protect its equity by easily folding out a significant portion of the opponent's range with a small, efficient bet, the EV for doing so will be relatively high. And finally, what about the button's strongest hands, such as aces and king x? Well, given that on this very dry board, so much of the big blind range will struggle to continue, these hands also don't mind betting small to entice ace x and backdoor combos to stay in the pot and possibly pick up a draw or pair on later streets. So from an EV perspective, in this balanced versus bottom heavy matchup, there is a strong incentive for all of the button's equity classes to compress and utilize a small sizing throughout. Facing the small bet, I decide to raise with my queen nine of diamonds and get the fold. And we do see that the solver likes to raise this combo at a low frequency, and it is in fact raising with around 23% of its range. So why is this happening when the big blind has a bottom heavy range and is at a nut disadvantage? Well, this is a good example of the full game of poker being much more complex and nuanced than a toy game model. The reality is that most real life ranges, in theory, should have some mix of strong, medium, and weak hands. They will just be weighted towards certain tiers of the equity distribution. Additionally, this scenario highlights why nut advantage, although important, isn't everything, and why thinking about the range as a whole is necessary. For example, both a balanced range and a polarized range, which we will discuss later, can have a nut advantage, but they will often be played very differently. Given that the button is likely betting its entire range in this spot, although its range is relatively stronger, it is also quite wide itself, with many hands completely whiffing on this board. In other words, the button's betting range, being balanced, has plenty of autofolds. So we see that the big blind counterattacks with a number of underpairs and 3x combos for protection, king x hands that are happy to play a big pot, 
And since there are no conventional draws on this board, backdoor combos as bluffs, such as the Queen 9 of Diamonds I was holding here. Now let's take a look at another hand I played in the same button versus big blind configuration, but where the range matchup is dramatically different due to the flop texture. In this one, I'm on the button with queens, I raise, and the big blind calls. The flop is 10-4-8, two-tone, the big blind checks, which we see is consistent with the strat on the king-king-3 board, but then I bet around three-quarters pot, and we see that the solver does like this larger sizing and is checking a significant portion of its range. So why the stark difference, especially when the player's ranges are identical to the prior scenario? Well, the button's range is still likely bounced with the nut advantage and some medium and weak hands as well, but on this board, the big blind simply has a lot more equity. It has plenty of 10x, 8x, and 4x. It also has numerous flush draws and straight draws between the 4 and 8 and the 8 and 10. It also has a bunch of combos that have over cards and backdoor equity as well. In short, the big blind's range on this board is more aptly characterized as mid-heavy. A mid-heavy range is typically created in one of three ways. One, by being the pre-flop caller, and the flop provides a number of weak connections to your range, such as lower pairs and draws. Two, by taking a passive check calling line versus multiple bets. Or three, by having an ample proportion of nutted hands, but choosing not to bet, particularly when in position. Similar to a bottom heavy range, a mid-heavy range is at a nut disadvantage, and is therefore mostly capped, so offensively, it will generally play passively, and when it does bet, the bet will usually be small. However, unlike a bottom heavy range, the mid heavy range isn't dominated by auto folds, so defensively, a mid heavy range is typically attacked with larger bets. From an EV perspective, a small bet by the button's weak and middling hands will simply not be as effective in terms of getting folds. And the button's strong hands now have a plethora of decent equity combos and villains range that it can extract value from with bigger bets. So here we see that the small bet is used at a much lower frequency, and instead the solver predominantly uses the 75% or even 120% sizings, and the range is doing a good amount of checking. This represents a more polarized betting scheme, which typically will be the betting scheme that is used most often against mid-heavy ranges. And this is a good example of how understanding overall range morphologies can help guide us on how we should be playing individual hands. Unlike the last scenario, since we're polarizing, we won't be betting the middle part of our range with high frequency. Instead, we'll be betting predominantly with our strongest hands, including queens and some bluffs. Villain calls my bet, the turn is the five of diamonds, and the big blind checks again. Interestingly, we see that unlike the flop, the solver does a decent amount of leading now. So why is this? Well, one thing we need to keep in mind is that range morphologies are not static, and they can change depending on the runout. If the turn or river card is a brick, then the range morphologies which were in place at the end of the immediately prior street will generally be retained in the new street, which makes things a bit easier to interpret. However, when a runout is very dynamic, it can change the range morphologies for both players, particularly when the runout uncaps a range that was mid or bottom heavy on the prior street, which is exactly what happened here. With the preflop ranges we use, the big blind has 7-6 off in its range, whereas the button only has 7-6 suited in its range, which gives the big blind more straights. The big blind also has a higher percentage of two pairs, including 10-5 and 10-4 suited, and 8-5 and 8-4 suited. In short, this turn card uncaps the big blind's range, making it more balanced, prompting the solver to seize the initiative with a portion of its range by making a small bet. And my range, on the other hand, is a representation of our final range morphology, polarized. As most of you know, a polarized range consists primarily of very strong hands and very weak hands with relatively little in the middle. A polarized range is typically created when a player has and maintains the initiative by betting across multiple streets, usually with larger sizings designed to get stacks in by the river. So in this case, by being the preflop aggressor, and continuing to bet on the flop with large sizing, my range started to polarize because generally speaking, mid-strength hands have a lower incentive to bet big since a big bet is more likely to cause villain to fold worse and only call with better. Now in this case, the five turn depolarized my range to a certain extent by adding more strong hands to villain's range, which in turn weakened many of the hands in my range. However, overall, my range is still mostly comprised of strong hands represented by the reddish colors and weak hands represented by the bluish colors. Because a polarized range tends to be mostly comprised of strong and weak hands, most of the time the polarized range will be on offense. 
since both of these classes of hands generally have a strong incentive to bet. However, in situations where a polarized range is on defense, since the middle part of a polarized range tends to be lacking, it will usually face smaller sizings targeting the trash portion of its range. But in this case, Villain refrained from betting, and so I continue with another 3 quarters pot bet. This lower card adds some lower pairs to the big blinds range, such as 7-5 and 9-5 hearts. On top of this, when the big blind simply called my flop bet and refrained from donking on the favorable turn card, it compressed his range towards the middle of the equity distribution even further. The net result of all of this is that the big blind's range has become even more mid-heavy, and so we aren't going to be using any small sizings in the button shoes. We're betting three quarters pot or more to get max value with our strongest hands, including our queens, and to apply max fold leverage with our bluffs in an attempt to get the big blind to muck some of his weaker pairs and draws, which it would be much less likely to do versus a smaller bet. But the big blind calls, the river is the seven of spades, and then villain donks out 130% of the pot, and I fold. So according to the solver, this donk by the big blind is simply not a thing. It appears this was a case of someone playing based on the strength of his hand, and not his range, which, as we said at the top, is contrary to how theoretically sound strategies are constructed. As we have established, the big blind's range was very mid-heavy on the prior street, and by calling the turn bet instead of raising, we can remove even more of his strongest and weakest hands. Now this 7 river does change the equities of both players to some degree since it brings in 4 to a straight, which gives the big blind some nuttish hands and diminishes the strength of many of my hands, such as my pocket queens. However, overall the big blind's range by and large is still mid-heavy. And having placed 3 bets in a row, my range in contrast is still mostly polarized. And from a range morphology standpoint, when a mid-heavy range is matched up with a polarized range, the mid-heavy range, particularly when out of position, will rarely do any betting, as it will typically go into pure bluff catcher mode, allowing the polarized range to take the initiative. Remember, a polarized range tends to be very offensive. So even if the big blind had a straight here or some other strong hand, checking to allow the polarized button to bet, and then check raising, would likely be the most profitable move. In this case, as mentioned, the 7 isn't a total brick because it does bring in a few straights and two pairs for the big blind, which depolarizes the button's range to a certain extent, but not quite enough for the big blind to donk out with an overbet, particularly since the big blind should have donked or raised some of his 6x on the turn. And the reason why, in theory, you don't want to form strategies based on the strength of your individual hand like this is because it will generally make you easier to play against, as it narrows your range dramatically and magnifies the value of card removal. From a theory perspective, combos tend to like to move in groups because it helps with information hiding. And this highlights why utilizing range morphologies can be very helpful if you're trying to play theoretically sound poker. As mentioned, it is very hard to retain in your mind all the likely combos in both players' ranges from street to street. It is much easier to keep mental tabs on the overall range shapes from prior streets and then in the current street reconstruct specific combos based on those morphologies to determine your strategy. By going through the exercise of mentally categorizing each player's range, it forces us to focus not just on specific regions or combos where it can be very easy to lose the forest for the trees, but rather on how the range as a whole is constructed big picture. And once we're able to categorize the overall range shape of both players, developing an overarching EV maximizing strategy for our actual hand becomes much simpler because when certain range morphologies match up against each other, they will often play in specific predictable ways.